this video I would like to talk a little bit about the Wheel of Karma according to the Buddhist Mahayana tradition. In Buddhism they view every spirit as basically being inherently enlightened. So we all have this inherently enlightened being within ourselves and the only reason that we are not currently enlightened is because we have become disbalanced by our attachments. And these attachments come in kind of six flavors. So these are the six segments of the Wheel of Karma. And some of these segments are things which we in modern society would see as positive or good. And some of these segments are what we would see in modern society as being bad or undesirable. But from the perspective of Buddhism, anything, whether it is good or bad, is undesirable if it keeps you away from our, in a way, our natural state, our ultimate state of being an enlightened being. So we will discuss these um, segments. We'll start with the lower three segments and then I will finish with the higher three segments. Even though they're considered equal, the lower three segments are called lower because from our, in a way, average as a human being, the vibrations which go along with these three segments are below our average yeah, vibration as a human. And the other segments, um, if we are in them, they tend to raise our vibration as a human being. So by having a lower vibration, in a way, our consciousness becomes more limited and by having a higher vibration, our consciousness tends to become more open, more aware. But even by having a high vibration, doesn't mean that we are enlightened. These are very much two different things within the Buddhistic frame of mind. We will start with the heaviest segment. And this is the part of anger and hate um, all these segments, they exist both within ourselves and they also exist outside of ourselves. So there are beings which are natural to these energies, which in a way always live in such a state. And yeah, beings from this world of hate and anger, um, they're, we tend to regard them as demons. Um, because they are very destructive, very disruptive. But if all these things would be undesirable to us, we would not feel very attached to them. So let us explore a little bit why this segment of anger is so interesting actually to us humans. Because what anger gives us is also a sense of superiority. I'm angry at the other person and because they wronged me or I am right or I am better, I am right, they are wrong. So anger allows us to feel superior. It also gives us more freedom from our morality because I would never hurt my brother or my sister but I'm okay with hurting one of them because they're the enemy. So in a way it gives us a sense of freedom from our own moral cages. And this is often gives us a rush, gives us an empowerment. We feel the power of our righteous anger. We feel that we're better than others. We feel liberated from our morality because we can do things which otherwise would be unthinkable. We might want to hit somebody or to hurt somebody, but no, we could never do that. Unless we are angry, unless we have this kind of an excuse or justification for this kind of behavior. And anger? For that very reason, it's one of the most addictive segments because of this brush of power which is experienced by the ego. Because the ego likes to be the winner. It likes to feel the power. It likes to feel its freedom. So our ego tends to have a very strong addiction to this world of anger, to this world of hatred, to this world of duality. It is us against them. So what's also important to understand is that when we're in such a state, we're giving off an energy, a very yeah, heavy 
fiery, active energy. And such energies also attract things which feed on such an energy. And we can call this evil spirits or demons or other things. And they like being fed, just like any animal, any being. They like food, they want to live, they want to survive. And for their survival, their ability to stay with on our level of consciousness, they need our anger. So they will try to keep us angry or to make us angry so that we will, we will continue to feed them. And in this way we go into a symbiosis with kind of a heavy energy or a dark power. We feed them and they keep us angry, they keep us strong, they keep us focused. And this is the kind of deal many people are subconsciously making. And so even if we ourselves become more aware and want to break free of this tendency, there are other powers which want to keep us there, which want to hold us there, in that position of the wheel of karma. The next segment is the segment of hunger and desires and lusts. <coughs> so rather than having a desire to, in a way, uh, destroy something or be opposite of something, it's an attraction. And you may think that this is better, but it's pretty much almost as bad. Because what happens if we are gripped by these desires, these lusts, these hungers, is that the higher part of our being basically goes right out of the door. Just like when we're angry, we stop thinking, we stop being rational, we stop being moral. And the same thing happens to us if we're gripped by a very strong desire or lust or hunger basically our survival instinct which also takes over because we need food, we need a drink, we need shelter. But also if we would not procreate our species would have disappeared long ago. So these are very strong driving energies but also very low driving energies. One of the problems is that it is sometimes very hard to satisfy these energies. Because often these lower hungers are in a way showing us that something is wrong on a very different level. I may eat because I'm stressed. I may seek love and attention because I have an inferiority complex. But if we cannot realize that there are actually higher problems and these lower lusts and hungers and desires are just in a way reflections of things we are denying or failing to comprehend, then chasing these lower things, chasing food, chasing attention will never end. Because by getting attention will not solve my self-image issues. By eating more will not take away my stress. Or eating less won't also take away my stress. And I being unable to identify the cause of the hunger, the cause of the desire, we can become very trapped and very uh, addicted to trying to satisfy these desires. Because while we have this craving, we feel very unsatisfied. And at the moment we are fulfilling the craving and shortly thereafter, maybe half hour, maybe three hours, we will feel satisfied feel at peace, we will feel calm. But after that the problem returns. And we also have mixed variants, like for instance self-harming, where you have a combination of anger and hunger. Like we in a way hunger to escape from the stress and by harming ourselves, by hurting ourselves, we feel a sort of control, we feel a focus, we get away from our problems. And we're in a way satisfying that need to get away from the stress. And the same with books or movies or games or sex or even conversations. Some people seek to escape their problems by having this unfulfillable need. And by perpetuating this behavior, we never allow ourselves to increase in consciousness, to see the real causes which are driving us in this, in this behavior. And then we get stuck on this level. But also on this level, there are spirits who 
you know, a feed of this type of energy, hunger spirits or hunger demons or lust or desire or addiction. And these powers will feed of our behavior and it will try to continue our behavior. But it's important to note that just like anger is either self-harm or harming another, forming this hunger is also a form of self-harm and often also harming others. Because others have to give us what we need and we tend to take what we are not given if we are gripped by this hunger, by these desires. So these two dimensions are called very much the kind of demonic uh, dimensions because of their very low vibrations and also the many entities which try to keep us there, to hold us there. The next segment is that basically of our instincts, of our habits, of our rituals. We all learn that uh, doing things in a certain way is normal to us, like we want to breathe enough, our heart needs to beat enough, we want to have enough food, enough water, enough light, enough sleep, enough rest, enough stimulation. And this is a kind of a, a knowledge of what is good for us, what's an equilibrium. And this leads to habits. I go to bed at a certain time, I eat at a certain time. Um, and these habits, in a way, become unconscious. They become a way of just perpetuating uh, a safe and yeah, kind of comfortable equilibrium, homeostasis, as it's called. So you want to stay in the same state, which is regarded as pleasurable. Not too hungry, not too thirsty, not too full. Uh, so not overstimulated, not understimulated. And this is in a way a very animal level of consciousness, a very animal level of intelligence, of doing things in a certain way because I always do it this way, I feel comfortable doing it this way. Um, society says we should do it in this way, so this is why I pray this way or go to church or read certain prayers or certain other behaviors, drive the speed limit, pay my taxes. They're all habits. They're all, in a way, automatic things which just happen. Then a way we need them, because if everything has to be a conscious choice, that's also very taxing, very tiring. So we need to automate certain things and to say like, okay, I will stop thinking about this, this is not that important. I'll just go with the flow and allow those things to happen. But if too many things go with the flow, we stop being individuals. We stop in a way renewing the collective we are part of. We are just going with the flow. We are floating along the stream. We are rocked by the waves. We are blown by the wind. And we deny that our spirit has a path in this life, a unique path. We have each unique gifts, unique desires, unique talents which need to develop. And if we just follow the masses, this will never happen. We are, or we have the potential to be more than animals, to be more than little drones. And of course it is not safe to do these things. And often we have a fear of getting out there and doing things which are not safe, which go against the masses, which go against the established order. But it is a necessity for our spirit to grow, that we do so. So here it is not so much the internal powers or the uh, demons which we have to fight, but more our social programming, which is the problem. The next phase of the, which is in a way what makes us human, which lives us, lifts us above the animal level because animals have desires, they have anger, they have habits, but to have curiosity is really what elevates the humans and also elevates some of the animals. Because certain animals also want to have a mission to use their talents to grow beyond their programming, you could say. And we humans are very flexible, so we can learn 
quite easily and quite a lot compared to animals. So this gives us an advantage in getting into these higher vibrations. The level of curiosity is also very much the level of the spirit. Because we come here as a spirit to experience life. To experience what it is like to have a body and all the challenges which go with it. The joys but also the burdens of having a body. And the unique opportunities of all these challenges. And the opportunity of communication. We can share knowledge through books, through videos, by talking with each other, by just meditating, by being close together and picking up on each other's vibrations even. So we have a lot of curiosity which we can fulfill. And when we're fulfilling this curiosity, we take risks. We go into the unknown. And we have need to have the yeah in a way the power to do that. And our own spirit guides and ancestral spirits they tend to help us with this. Because they know our unique talents, our unique energy body structure, what we can give to the world and what we need to, to receive from the world as well. And they want us to discover all our needs and also all our talents, all our gifts, so that we can have as much of an exchange as possible, so that our spirit becomes enriched by being incarnated. Curiosity in itself can also be a limiting factor, which keeps us from taking a step further. The next step is the step of ambition. So curiosity is a very playful thing. You just want to look at things, to experience things, just like a child. Once you get to ambition, there's a goal. You don't just want to know things, you want to reach a certain goal. You want to have a certain power or a certain position. And as soon as you have ambition, it is in a way higher, but also more rigid than mere curiosity. Because to attain your ambition, you also need to develop yourself, you need to learn. But it is more focused, it is going towards something. And one of the problems with ambition is that it can, in a way, pair up with not just curiosity, but also things like envy, uh, jealousy, greed and other very very limiting and addictive uh, feelings. Vanity, pride are also some of the sins which can attach to that. So while having ambition can help us to have a more focused growth and we can go more quickly upon a path of development, it can also make us very rigid, very narrow and Ultimately, it can even also lower our consciousness if these yeah, problematic sins become stronger than the pure ambition and the joy of growing, of developing, of being more to others and giving more to others. So it is very important to look where is the ambition coming from because we all have ambitions, we all have parts in ourselves which are imperfect, which are striving for perfection. All of us are in a way yeah, separated from higher states of consciousness and we want to raise our consciousness and get closer to our source or um, to whatever higher powers we feel connected to. So there's a light side but also a very dark side to ambition. And ambition can also mislead us because what are the sacrifices we are willing to make to reach our goals? And sometimes you have to acknowledge that it is not worth it. Or you have to let go of an ambition because the changes which are required of you are not changes which are good for you. So it is very difficult to be critical of your own ambitions um, because of the strong desire. And we see the light at the end of the tunnel. But it's also very important to see that we're going in a tunnel which may give us more darkness than light. And that the light at the, at the end may not be enough to outweigh the darkness we have embraced to get there. Which brings us to the last segment, 
that of enjoyment and contentment. Now many people will say, how is that a problem if you're satisfied, if you're happy? Isn't that what we all strive for? Yes, and that is the big, big problem. <laughs> because just as, in a way, anger is very addictive because it gives us a feeling that we have arrived, that we are on the winning side, that we are on the right side, that God is with us and we are fighting for justice. In the same way, contentment and satisfaction give us this feeling that we have arrived. It gives us a feeling that we are at our top, that we don't need to do anything more, that we are already accomplished in everything. And that gives us a great, great stagnation. We are no longer curious. We no longer look for challenges. We no longer feel the need to serve others in new ways. We feel that, well, what we're doing is enough. And this is a very, very big and very, very difficult trap to get out of. Because we become so used to it and it is being like being rocked to sleep like a baby. You have everything you need. You're being loved, you get the attention you want, you get everything you want. You no longer have these lower hungers, you no longer have this anger. You have nothing driving you, motivating you, moving you anymore. And this is when we have to realize that ultimately our life is not about being happy. It is not about being content. It is a journey of our spirit. And our spirit wants to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And if our spirit did not want to grow, it would not incarnate. These higher worlds are much, much easier to satisfy all your needs and all your desires than the physical world. The very fact that we are down here means that our spirit wants to grow, is somehow dissatisfied, looking for stimulation. So don't fall into this trap, but recognize it for what it is. You're just being frozen in place, you're being comfortably numb. You're not listening to the cries of your spirit, because your incarnation, your ego, is too satisfied. And we all have these elements these six elements within our, our being. And everything we do, we say, we feel arises from these elements. Every feeling I have, every thought I have, every image which comes to my mind is in a way generated by the wheel of karma. And the more unbalanced the wheel is, the more unbalanced my life will be. So it is important to realize that we have all these elements, we need all these elements, but they're in a way also counterbalancing each other. And we need these elements in different situations. So sometimes it is necessary to be angry, sometimes it is necessary to be greedy, to be hungry, to be lustful, sometimes it is necessary to follow your routines, to listen to your inner knowledge, to your instincts. Yes, but also it can be necessary to be curious, to be ambitious, and also to reward yourself, to have that rest, to relax for a moment and to enjoy and appreciate what you have. And as long as the wheel of karma is turning, that is okay, because our spirit is moving. We are growing by alternating these powers. And ultimately, we are trying to make all this whole wheel, not just turning, but also getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that our enlightened spirit won't get pulled out of its balance as much. It won't be obfuscated as much. And the smaller the wheel gets, the less our spirit becomes blinded and trapped. So it is good to look at all these forces, try to achieve balance, try to achieve emotion. If you're more in one segment, try to move to the next segment, and the next, and the next. To 
try to spin the wheel and lighten it while we're spinning it. While the wheel is spinning, it change is happening. And the change can make you lighter, more aware as a spirit, or it can make you heavier and more trapped. So we need to spin the wheel, but also to see that every rotation is a spiral going upwards and upwards while the wheel is getting smaller and smaller but ultimately only enlightenment exists and when the wheel is spinning downwards we're in a way turning into a huge cone or pyramid where we're going into the base and every structure also needs a base I'm not denying it but the base should not keep us from going up, it should help us and stabilize us so that we can go up without falling down. If I have only ambition, but I forget to eat, I forget to drink, I cannot defend myself against my opponents, this ambition is not going to go anywhere. If I have habits, I'm not going to go anywhere. If I'm curious, but I cannot really look at different sides of arguments. I cannot go onto one side and be angry at the other and then switch sides and look at it from the other side. How can I gain understanding if I cannot look at things from different perspectives, which anger helps me to do. So everything can help us, but can also hinder us. And to have a look at this wheel of karma, I want to introduce a little meditation in the next video.